As we pull up to the remote cabin, a surge of relief washes over me. After hours of driving, the sight of our destination feels almost surreal. The cabin stands proudly, a rustic wooden structure with a hint of age to it, nestled amidst a grove of tall, majestic pine trees. Its wooden panels, aged by the seasons, are a mix of deep browns and grays, with hints of green moss near the base, giving it a sense of belonging to the landscape. The cabin is two stories high, with a slanted roof that's covered in a thick layer of pine needles from the towering trees overhead. A stone chimney rises from one side, promising cozy fires on chilly nights. Windows with deep wooden frames look out from the cabin, some adorned with simple white curtains that wave slightly from the gentle breeze. The sun, now in its descent, filters through the dense foliage, casting dappled light upon the cabin, making the grain in the woods seem more pronounced. The surrounding area is clear, giving way to a view of the forest beyond, with wildflowers dotting the landscape. A wooden porch wraps around a part of the cabin, furnished with rocking chairs. As I step out of the car, the air hits me. It's pure, cool, and invigorating. The dominating scent is that of pine, but beneath it there's the unmistakable smell of earth and hints of wildflowers. The gentle sound of wind rustling through the leaves completes the serene ambience. This cabin, with its perfect blend of rugged charm and natural beauty, promises a break from our chaotic city life, and I'm wholeheartedly ready to embrace it. Dad, can I go explore? My younger son Lucas asks eagerly. His eyes, reflecting the brilliant colors of the forest around us, are wide with anticipation. Beside him, his older sister Mia stands with one hand shading her eyes, already scanning the dense tree line of the woods. The mischievous glint in her eyes suggests she's ready to dive into whatever secrets the forest holds. After we unpack, I reply, trying to instill a touch of patience into the children's bubbling enthusiasm. I glance over at my wife Lisa, expecting her to back me up, but she's engrossed, her eyes lingering fondly on the rustic charm of the cabin. She turns to me, her lips curling into a gentle smile. It's perfect, she says, her fingers intertwining with mine in a reassuring grip. It's exactly what we needed. As the day unfolds, the kid's curiosity proves unstoppable. Once the luggage is stowed away inside the cabin, they drag us into the wild embrace of nature. Lucas, with his sharp eyes and keen sense of observation, stumbles upon a hidden treasure, a small stream that meanders through a patch of the woods. The waters are so crystal clear that you can see the smooth pebbles and curious little fish darting about at the bottom. Laughter fills the air as we splash around. Mia has different priorities. With a determination that's both adorable and impressive, she takes charge of gathering materials for the evening. She's on a mission, collecting an array of twigs, fallen branches, and the perfectly shaped pine cones scattered around. She declares that they'll be perfect kindling for the fireplace and her face is illuminated with pride at her contribution to our evening's warmth and comfort. The promise of a cozy night ahead, surrounded by the warmth of the fire and the love of family, fills us all with a contented joy. As the sun dips below the horizon, casting the woods in a soft twilight glow, we find ourselves comfortably settled in the cabin. The wooden walls, aged by time and weather, emanate a warm, earthy aroma that brings to mind memories of past woodland retreats. Knots in the wood grain and the occasional creak of the floorboards underfoot add to the cabin's rustic charm. The heart of the cabin, the fireplace, comes alive with a spirited blaze. The crackling of the burning logs is a comforting sound, with flames that dance and leap, casting a warm golden hue around the room. For dinner, we opt for simplicity. Sandwiches filled with fresh ingredients and glasses of chilled juice. Yet in this environment, even this basic meal feels like a feast. The ambiance, the warmth, and the company elevate the experience, making it memorable. With the darkness deepening outside, Lisa and I guide the children to their bedroom. The room, dimly lit by a bedside lamp, is filled with the soft sounds of whispered secrets between Lucas and Mia. They share giggles and hushed tales of the day's adventures their voices dripping with innocence and joy. The sight warms my heart, a reminder of the simple joys of family. Assured that they're safely tucked in, Lisa and I retreat to the porch. 
The night is cool, prompting us to wrap ourselves in thick, cozy blankets. The vast expanse of the night sky stretches above us, dotted with countless stars, some twinkling, others shining with a steady glow. The universe seems to spread infinitely, and the beauty of it all leaves us in awe. Lisa's head finds a resting place on my shoulder, her hair brushing against my neck. It's so peaceful here, she murmurs. I find myself nodding in agreement, taking a moment to absorb the stillness of the night, the chirping of the crickets, and the distant hoot of an owl. I give her hand a gentle squeeze, reaffirming our shared sentiment. This is exactly what we needed, I respond, gratitude evident in my voice. Then suddenly, an unnerving sound, originating from above, slices through the otherwise tranquil atmosphere, causing both Lisa and I to jolt upright. The noise is unmistakable, a thudding that resembles the pacing of footsteps on the cabin's wooden roof. Lisa's fingers clamp tightly around my arm, her nails digging in slightly. Her eyes are wide with a mix of fear and confusion and search mine for answers. What is that? She asks, her voice a mere whisper, choked with anxiety. I'm not sure, I admit, forcing a steadiness into my voice that I don't truly feel. Could be small animals playing around, I suggest, hopefully, clinging to any logical explanation that comes to mind. However, even as the words leave my mouth, doubt settles in. The thuds are far too heavy and too deliberate to be dismissed as the antics of small woodland creatures. Then another set of footsteps joins the first. Suddenly the door to the children's room slams open causing us both to startle. Lucas and Mia, eyes wide and reflecting their fear, dash out. Their usual playful and confident demeanor is nowhere to be seen, replaced by sheer panic. Daddy, what's that noise? Lucas manages to whisper, his small frame trembling as he looks up at me. I kneel down, wrapping an arm around Lucas, trying to project a sense of security. Probably just animals, bud, I say, hoping to reassure him. Mia isn't as easily comforted. She shoots me a skeptical look, her eyebrows furrowing in doubt. They don't sound like animals, she declares. Her tone firm, revealing an edge of growing fear and unease. Lisa, trying her best to maintain a facade of composure, casts a glance at the kids. Let's all stay in the living room tonight, she proposes. The strain is evident in her eyes, despite the calmness she forces into her voice. It might just be the unfamiliar sounds of the woods playing tricks on our minds. We'll be okay if we stick together. Nodding in agreement, I help rearrange the couch cushions and blankets, creating a makeshift bed. The children settle in between Lisa and me. The eerie footsteps persist, fading in and out, but never entirely ceasing. Each thud resonates with a heaviness, echoing within the confines of the room and sending involuntary shivers down my spine. The weight of the situation, coupled with the exhaustion of the day, slowly nudges us towards sleep. But it isn't the peaceful slumber we had hoped for. Instead, it's a fitful, shallow rest, punctuated by vivid and unsettling dreams that blur the line between reality and the dream world. A soft, distressed cry from Mia jolts me awake. My eyes snap open, trying to adjust to the darkness that engulfs the room. The fire from earlier has died down to mere embers, casting a faint reddish glow. All I can discern are the silhouettes of my family and the steady rise and fall of their chests. The haunting footsteps that interrupted our night have stopped. An uneasy silence reigns, broken only by the distant sounds of the forest night. Despite the stillness, an intangible heaviness hangs in the air, a residue of the night's unexplained events. The dream of a restful and rejuvenating vacation now feels distant, overshadowed by the mysteries of the night and the unanswered questions they bring. Eventually, the pale light of dawn filters through the cabin's windows, casting a soft golden glow on everything it touches. Birds chirp merrily outside and the world seems to come alive, but the beauty of the morning feels somewhat muted, overshadowed by the mysteries of the previous night. The memories of those eerie footsteps remain vivid in our minds, and breakfast is a quiet affair, punctuated by shared glances and hesitations. Over buttered toast and freshly brewed coffee, the topic we've all been avoiding finally comes up. Lucas, with his voice hesitant, asks, Do you think it was just animals on the roof? 
Mia points out the inconsistency of such heavy footsteps belonging to woodland creatures. Lisa recounts some stories she has heard about old cabins settling and making noises. Each theory is presented, dissected, and then set aside as none seem to fully capture the strange nature of the sounds. Determined to keep a positive outlook, I break the silence. We came here for a peaceful getaway, and we won't let one odd night define our trip, I say with more conviction than I feel. But deep down, a feeling of unease gnaws at me. Lucas and Mia exchange glances, and while they nod in agreement, their apprehension is evident. They have always looked up to me for reassurance, but I can see the trust weaken slightly, replaced by concern. Lisa offers a smile, albeit a hesitant one. As the day progresses, we immerse ourselves in activities to keep our minds off the previous night. We hike, fish by the stream, and even have an impromptu picnic. Yet despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of anxiety remains. Shadows seem to stretch longer, and every rustle in the underbrush is met with heightened alertness. The descent of dusk is both beautiful and ominous. The sky, painted in hues of pink, orange, and purple, is a signal's the approach of another night. And with it the memories of the unsettling sounds come rushing back. As the world outside grows darker, and the sounds of the forest come alive, an almost tangible tension fills the cabin, thick and oppressive, as we brace ourselves for what the night might bring. As darkness takes hold, the ambient sounds of the forest amplify, but among the familiar there's a strange and haunting silence. No sooner than we settle down for the evening, a faint tapping sound emerges. At first it seems to be coming from a distance, like a gentle knock against wood. But gradually it grows louder and more persistent, echoing around the cabin. It's not just coming from one direction anymore. It's as if the entire cabin is being encircled by these intermittent taps. The fireplace, which was burning brightly earlier, now flickers as if disturbed by an invisible draft. Every so often, a cold gust of wind seems to move through the cabin, even though every door and window is firmly shut. Lucas, clutching his blanket, whispers, Why do the lights keep dimming? It's true. The lanterns that we've placed in the living room, which were filled with fresh oil, now burn with a weak, unsteady flame, plunging the room into sporadic darkness. Then Mia points towards one of the windows with a trembling hand. Pressed against the glass is a pale face, but as quickly as we all turn to look, it vanishes, leaving only the reflection of the dim lanterns and our terrified faces. The atmosphere is thick with fear. Lisa suggests, It's a brave attempt to inject some normality into the situation, but her voice trembles, revealing her own fear. But before we can even consider her suggestion, the front door, which we are sure was locked, slowly creaks open by itself. A cold wind rushes in, causing the flames in the fireplace to dance wildly. The room is filled with the scent of damp earth and something else, something metallic. Gathering my courage, I approach the door to shut it. As I near, I notice footprints on the cabin's wooden floor, wet, muddy footprints that lead to the children's room and then disappear. The realization hits hard. Whatever was outside is now, or was recently, inside with us. We need to stick together, I murmur feeling the weight of the responsibility to protect my family. Other odd occurrences continue, whispers that seem to float in the air but are impossible to trace, items inexplicably moving from their original places, and a persistent feeling of being watched. The following morning, as breakfast dishes clatter softly, the mood is subdued. The events of the previous night loom over us, and I feel the need to change our surroundings, even if just for a bit. Pushing my plate away, I say, The woods might offer a nice distraction. Lisa hesitates, her gaze lingering on the kids. Are you sure? After last night? I nod. We can't let whatever that was keep us inside. Fresh air will do us good. With some reluctance, we bundle up and step outside. After a few minutes of walking, I realize something feels off. Do you hear that? The weight of the silence presses in, making my voice sound overly loud. Lisa stops beside me with a confused look on her face. Hear what? There's nothing. That's the point, I say, glancing around uneasily. It's too quiet. Lucas tugs at my sleeve. Why aren't the birds singing, Dad? 
Are they sleeping? I try to find an answer that'll make sense to his young mind. I'm not sure, buddy. Maybe they're just having a quiet day. As we continue our walk, the silence stays, amplifying the uncertainty from the night before and casting a shadow over our attempt to find solace in the beauty of nature. Eventually, we start to retrace our steps, but it's clear that everyone is more alert now. Lucas clutches my hand tightly. Dad, he whispers with his eyes wide. Where are all the animals? Sometimes animals can be shy, especially when they hear people. Maybe we're just a bit too noisy for them today. Mia isn't convinced, but there's not even a bird in the sky, she points out, looking up at the treetops. Her observation is accurate. The clear blue sky above us is devoid of any flying creatures. Lisa attempts to divert their attention. How about a game? Let's see who can find the most unique leaf or twig on our way back. She bends down, picking up a strangely shaped twig as an example. For a moment, the children are distracted, excitedly searching the forest floor for their finds. Their laughter and chatter fill the air, offering a temporary break from the growing unease. I exchange a look with Lisa, appreciating her effort. But as we continue our journey back to the cabin, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. I keep scanning the woods, expecting to catch a glimpse of a deer or even another person, but there's nothing. The forest feels empty. By the time we reach the cabin, our earlier enthusiasm has evaporated. The promise of lunch and the safety of the cabin walls seem more inviting than ever. Maybe later we can try exploring in a different direction. Everyone agrees, and as we enter the cabin, there's a collective sigh of relief. After lunch, I feel the need for a moment of solitude. I decide to head out to the car to grab a tool I remember leaving in the trunk. The idea of maybe fixing a few things around the cabin could serve as a productive distraction. As I approach the vehicle, something feels off. It looks just as we left it. But then, small details begin to emerge. The driver's side door is slightly ajar, not wide open, but just enough to be noticeable. I'm certain I locked it. I open the door cautiously, half expecting to find something wrong inside. However, everything seems in order. I decide to start the car, just to be sure. Turning the key in the ignition, the engine sputters but doesn't catch. I try again. The same result. My heart sinks. An unsettling thought takes root. The night's events, the eerie silence of the forest, and now this. I pop the hood in a quick survey doesn't reveal anything blatantly out of place, but I notice a few wires loosely hanging, not completely detached, but enough to prevent the car from starting. A chill runs down my spine. This is no accident. Determined. I decide to assess the damage further. With the right tools, maybe, just maybe, I can fix it. But it's clear to me now, someone or something doesn't want us to leave just yet. As I head back to the cabin, I'm torn. I don't want to alarm Lisa and the kids, but they deserve to know. Mia spots me first, her sharp eyes catching the concern on my face. She asks, her voice tinged with worry. Taking a deep breath, I say, The car's acting up, but I think I can fix it, just a minor hiccup. Lisa approaches with a questioning look in her eyes. Is everything okay? I nod, trying to sound reassuring. It's just a small issue, don't worry about it. We all head back inside, but the unspoken tension remains. As afternoon transitions to evening, I work tirelessly on the car while Lisa engages the kids in games, trying to keep their spirits up. Despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of fear runs through everything. As night approaches, the decision weighs heavily on us. We'll stay one more night, I declare. Tomorrow, we'll figure out our next move. The sun dips below the horizon, casting the world in darkness once more. As afternoon transitions to evening, I work tirelessly on the car. I'm no mechanic by any means, but I'm doing what I can. Meanwhile, Lisa engages the kids in games, trying to keep their spirits up. She leads them in a series of light-hearted activities, from card games to drawing sessions. It's a warm and necessary distraction from the growing unease surrounding us. Despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of fear runs through everything. The kids try to immerse themselves in play, yet I can see the shadow of worry in their youthful eyes. When dinner time comes around, our meal is subdued. Conversation tries to veer toward happy topics, 
yet it's consistently interrupted by long silences. As night approaches, the decision weighs heavily on us. The ticking clock seems louder, a relentless reminder of the time slipping away and the impending night. We'll stay one more night, I declare, my voice trying to bear the weight of conviction. Tomorrow we'll figure out our next move. I try to instill a sense of hope, but in the pit of my stomach, unease churns, mixing with a stubborn determination to protect my family at all costs. Outside, the sun dips below the horizon, casting the world in darkness once more. The night outside is eerily quiet, amplifying every sound within the cabin. As we gather around the fireplace, a sudden cold gust of wind sweeps through despite all the windows and doors being firmly shut. It makes the flames sputter for a moment before they stabilize. Just as we start to settle down, a low drawn-out scraping sound resonates from the side of the cabin. It's as if someone or something is slowly dragging a heavy object along the outer walls. Before we can process this, a series of soft, deliberate taps comes from the windows. It's not the chaotic pattern of rain or tree branches. These taps are methodical, almost curious. I rise, moving cautiously to one of the windows to investigate. But as I pull back the curtain, I'm met with only the darkness of the woods. Mia trying to mask her fear whispers, it's just the woods playing tricks on us, right? Her attempt at bravery is commendable, but the tremor in her voice is evident. Lucas, burying his face into Lisa's side, clutches her tightly. As the night drags on, other inexplicable occurrences plague us. The sound of faint, distant laughter drifts in, carried by the wind, chilling in its lack of source or reason. Shadows, not cast by any discernible object, dart across the walls. Every time we think the disturbances have ended, a new one begins ensuring our anxiety remains at its peak. After a night of restless sleep, the morning sun shines through the curtains, but its warmth does little to alleviate the chill of fear that has settled in our bones. Lucas is the first to stir, his sleepy eyes opening to take in the dim room. Is it over? He asks, his voice shaking. I pull him close. It's morning, buddy. We're okay. Mia is curled up beside Lisa, her face buried in the crook of her mother's arm. I don't like this place anymore, she mumbles, her words muffled. Lisa strokes Mia's hair, her eyes meeting mine. We share a moment of silent understanding. We need to get out of here. But first, we need to know what we're up against. Let's have breakfast, Lisa suggests, her voice deliberately cheerful. Then we can decide what to do. The act of preparing food is oddly comforting. The familiar sounds of sizzling and the aroma of cooking give us a momentary escape, but the unease is noticeable, hanging in the air like a dense fog. After eating, I suggest we take another look outside. The cabin feels confining and maybe a change of scene will help. But as we step out, that suffocating silence greets us again. No birds chirping, no rustle of leaves, just an oppressive stillness. Why is it so quiet? Mia whispers her voice carrying in the expanse of the silent forest. Before I can answer, a soft thud from behind makes us all turn. A small stone lies at the foot of the cabin door. I frown, looking around for the source. But there's no one in sight. Lisa's voice breaks through my concentration. Look! she exclaims, pointing towards the woods. For a brief moment I think I see a shadow dart between the trees, but when I blink, it's gone. Throughout the day, more unexplainable events unfold. A stack of logs beside the fireplace rearranges itself. The reflection in the cabin windows shows an unfamiliar landscape. Our food supplies seem to diminish faster than they should, as if some of it just vanishes. Lisa and I are on edge, exchanging worried glances. It's clear that something is very wrong with this place. By late afternoon, as we're trying to rally our spirits with a game of cards, Lucas suddenly freezes with his gaze fixed on the window. Who's that? He whispers. I follow his line of sight and my heart skips a beat. Staring right at us is a face. It's pale, almost translucent, with hollow eyes. But as quickly as I spot it, it disappears. As night begins to fall, the realization sets in. We're trapped in this isolated cabin surrounded by an unseen force with no immediate means of escape. We gather in the living room, forming a tight circle on the floor. 
The only light comes from the candles we've placed around us. Time seems to slow as the night deepens. An unidentifiable scratching sound starts from the cabin's far corner, dragging slowly and steadily towards us. The scratching intensifies, moving up the walls and circling around us. Suddenly Lucas, pointing towards a window and whispers, Look! As our eyes turn, we see dozens of those pale, hollow-eyed faces staring at us, just as quickly as they appear. They vanish. The hours stretch on, punctuated by strange noises, whispers that seem to float in from nowhere, soft footsteps outside the cabin, and the sounds of laughter in the distance. It's as if the forest itself is alive, toying with us. The first rays of sunlight fill the room. I stir from a fitful sleep. I sit up and see that Lisa is already awake. She's gazing out the window, deep in thought. Lucas and Mia are on the floor, entangled in a mess of blankets. Morning, I whisper, my voice sounding hoarse. Lisa turns her head and gives a faint smile. Morning, she replies. We move in tandem, getting breakfast ready. As we eat our meal of cereal and milk, an idea forms in my mind. We need to find someone. Another cabin, maybe. Someone must live nearby who can help us. I propose trying to sound more hopeful than I feel. Lisa nods, her fingers tapping anxiously on the table. Yes, we should explore further into the woods. We haven't gone deep enough. Gathering our strength, we pack some essentials and set out. The dense forest surrounds us, and the thick canopy above allows only specks of sunlight to pierce through. Every step is accompanied by the soft crunch of fallen leaves and twigs beneath our feet. The world outside the woods seems distant. The air carries a heavy sense of anticipation, as if the forest itself is holding its breath. After what feels like hours of walking through the thick foliage, an outline begins to take shape. It's the silhouette of a cabin. There! Mia's voice breaks the silence, her finger pointing excitedly towards the growing structure. A cabin! Hope courses through us, making our feet move faster. The promise of potential safety or assistance propels us forward. The cabin slowly comes into clearer view, revealing its details. The wooden logs it's constructed from, the moss growing on its northern side, even the lone swing hanging from a tree nearby. But as we continue our approach, an eerie sense of deja vu grips me. Those chipped paint patches on the door, the slightly tilted mailbox, the pattern of the curtains. It dawns on me with an unsettling clarity. This is our cabin. Somehow in this vast forest we've ended up right back where we started. I stop in my tracks, feeling as if the ground has shifted beneath me. Lisa looks at the cabin and her face turns pale. How is this possible? The disbelief in her voice is palpable. We made sure to walk straight. Upon realizing we've circled back to our own cabin, a heavy silence falls over us. We stand still, taking in the eerie familiarity of our surroundings. For a moment everything seems suspended, as if time itself is hesitating. As we step into the cabin, the weight of our situation becomes even more pressing. We decide to ration our remaining food and water, ensuring we have enough to last us if our stay is prolonged. As the day progresses, we work on fortifying the cabin. The unsettling occurrences of the previous nights have left us on edge, and we need to feel safe. Lisa and I fashion makeshift weapons using kitchen utensils, while Mia and Lucas help by collecting large branches from outside. We reinforce the cabin doors and windows with whatever materials we find. The night begins to creep in, bringing with it a renewed sense of apprehension. The forest outside darkens, and the sounds become more pronounced. The chirping of crickets, the distant hooting of an owl, and the occasional rustling of leaves. But these familiar sounds only heighten the awareness of the uncanny silence we noticed earlier. Dinner is a quiet affair. We sit around the table with the dim glow from a lantern illuminating our faces. The food provides little comfort, and our conversation is sparse. Every noise from the outside makes us jump. As darkness fully engulfs the woods, we gather in the main living area of the cabin, keeping the lights dim. We take turns keeping watch, straining our ears for any signs of movement outside. Lucas, struggling to keep his eyes open, eventually drifts off to sleep. 
nestled between Lisa and me. Mia stays awake, her sharp eyes scanning the darkness outside. Hours seem to pass like days, each minute stretching out endlessly. The unease is palpable, and every creak of the cabin or rustle of the trees sends our hearts racing. It's going to be a long night. Throughout the night, the stillness is punctuated by unexpected noises. At one point, a soft tapping sound resonates from one of the windows, causing all of us to turn our heads sharply in its direction. There's nothing visible outside, but the tapping continues intermittently, almost as if someone or something is trying to gauge our reactions. Suddenly, a low, mournful howl pierces the night air. It's neither a wolf nor any animal I recognize. The howl seems distant, but it echoes through the forest creating an eerie harmony with the silence. Then another howl responds. This one is closer, and then another. It's as if the forest has come alive with these strange cries. Lisa pulls Lucas closer to her, covering his ears, attempting to shield him from the unnerving sounds. As the hours drag on, a thick fog begins to envelop the cabin. It seeps in from the forest, clouding the windows and making the outside world appear as an opaque white blanket. The visibility reduces drastically, and the world outside becomes a blur. The combination of the fog and the strange sounds keeps us on high alert. Every so often we can make out shadows moving through the mist, but it's impossible to discern their origin or intentions. After a night of restless sleep, the first light of dawn breaks over the horizon and casting a gentle glow that paints the sky with a mesmerizing blend of orange and pink. The dense fog that has blanketed the cabin and surrounding woods since last night starts to retreat slowly, revealing the tree line. This change in visibility stirs something within me, a feeling of hope and an idea. Taking a deep breath, I turn to face my family, who are gathered in the dimly lit living room. We need to move. Now while we have the advantage of daylight, I assert letting the weight of my words sink in. The morning's soft glow won't last, and neither can our time in this place. We can't stay trapped here, I add, my tone revealing a mix of determination and concern. Lisa nods in agreement. Every moment we wait, the odds stack against us. We have to act quickly. We quickly gather what we need and brace ourselves for the journey ahead. As we push forward through the forest, I pull out some twine and old shirts we had packed earlier. With swift hands, Lisa and I rip the shirts into strips. We decide on a system. Every few yards, one of us ties a piece of shirt to a tree using the twine, creating a clear marker. The aim is to ensure we don't end up retracing our steps unknowingly, as we had before. The forest around us seems to pulse with life, yet the eerie silence continues. Every rustling leaf, Every snap twig makes our heads turn, our eyes scanning the area for signs of movement. After a couple of hours, Mia suddenly points ahead. Look, she whispers, her voice tinged with a mix of excitement and caution. Squinting, I see it. A road. Relief washes over us. However, this moment of excitement is brutally short-lived. The familiar spine-chilling howl from the night pierces the air. It's the same haunting sound. Only now it's infused with what seems like anger or frustration, and worse, it sounds much closer than before. Adrenaline surges through me. Run! I shout. I grasp Lucas's hand tightly, pulling him along while Lisa takes Mia's hand, and we sprint towards the road, desperate to reach safety before whatever is behind us catches up. The intensity of our sprint makes every breath feel like fire. Each inhale and exhale is synchronized with our pounding footsteps. The terrifying howls seem to chase us, echoing through the trees and urging us to move faster, not to look back. It's as if the forest itself wants to pull us back into its dark embrace. When the woods finally break open to reveal the road, the sight of an approaching truck feels like a beacon of hope. The blinding glare of its headlights momentarily stuns us, making us freeze in our tracks and the scent of burning rubber fills the air as the truck skids to a stop just a few feet away. The door of the truck swings open and a man peers out. His face holds a mix of concern and curiosity. Need a lift? He shouts over the rumble of the truck's engine. His eyes dart briefly to the woods behind us, as if understanding the unspoken danger we're running from. 
Gratefully and with no time for formalities, we scramble into the truck's cabin. As the truck roars to life and begins to move, I risk a glance back at the forest from which we had just emerged. The trees, shrouded in shadows, appear almost menacing. I could swear I see fleeting movements, dark shapes that dart between the trunks, watching and waiting. But as the distance between us and the woods grows, those haunting images blur into the backdrop, becoming just another part of the landscape we're leaving behind. Hank's truck rumbles down the road. The rhythmic bounce feels somewhat soothing after the day's trauma. The interior of the truck is well-worn, with the leather seats cracked from years of use, and there's the smell of fresh hay and a hint of motor oil in the air. He occasionally glances our way, likely gauging our level of distress. As he begins to talk, there's a certain weight to Hank's words, indicating that our story isn't the first of its kind he's come across. There's old legends about that place, he adds, his voice rough but gentle, like sandpaper smoothed by time. Folks around here tend to avoid it, especially after sunset. After a while, we arrive at his farm. The sprawling expanse of Hank's farm is a contrast to the oppressive woods we left behind. Rolling fields, grazing cattle, and a gentle wind carrying the scent of blooming flowers greets us. It's like stepping into another world. When we pull up to the farmhouse, a modest structure with white paint and a picket fence, Hank's dog, a loyal-looking German shepherd, bounds up to greet us with its tail wagging. There's a warmth here, an aura of peace that instantly puts us at ease. You're welcome to stay the night, Hank offers, gesturing towards the home. I've got spare rooms and you could use a good rest. Gratefully, we accept his offer. The house is a cozy haven, filled with memories captured in framed photographs and the aroma of a home-cooked meal. Stew by the smell of it, wafting from the kitchen. There's a comforting feeling here that makes the eerie events of the past few days seem surreal. That night, as we sit around Hank's wooden dining table, the golden glow from the overhead eat and share stories. Despite the horrors we've faced, the sound of laughter and the safety of the farmhouse help mend the frayed edges of our spirits. Outside, the soft hoot of an owl and the chirping of crickets serenade us. Wrapped in blankets, sipping on mugs of warm cocoa provided by Hank, we start to feel a sense of security we hadn't felt in days. And as we drift off to sleep in the soft beds of the farmhouse, the nightmares of the woods seem at least for now, to be locked safely away.